If a Christian had gone into a Christian bookstore 25 or 30 years ago to buy a book on the religious cults, I think without question they would have found a section on Roman Catholicism. If they go into a Christian bookstore today to buy a similar book, they will not find a section on Roman Catholicism. So is Roman Catholicism Christian or is it cultic? I suppose it depends on what your definition of a cult is. Personally, I look for four features that are often found in the cults. The four features are these. A cult usually has an earthly head or founder. Second point is they will have an authority which is in addition to or in place of the Bible. Thirdly, they will have a wrong view of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And fourthly, as a consequence, they will have a wrong view of salvation. And when you look at Roman Catholicism, you find that it qualifies on all four points, an earthly head or founder. The Pope is declared to be the visible head of the church, yet the scriptures know only one head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation stone of the Christian church is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, yet Rome would claim that Peter is the foundation stone. So Rome qualifies on point number one. Secondly, an additional authority uh, in place of the scripture. Yes, they give a place to the scriptures, but they say that sacred tradition along with the Bible makes up the word of God. So yes, they have an additional authority. Now, what about the person and work of Christ? I have been told, but sure, the Christ of Roman Catholicism is the Christ of the scriptures. Is he? I think it's interesting to look at the relationship between Christ and Mary in the scriptures and Christ and Mary in the Roman Catholic Church. And what you find in the Roman Catholic Church is that Christ has been robbed and Mary has been robed with attributes that belong to Christ alone. Christ alone was uniquely, immaculately conceived without sin because he had no earthly father, no son of Adam was his father. Therefore, he was born without sin. But Rome says, no, Mary was immaculately conceived. The Lord Jesus Christ alone lived a sinless life. He knew no sin, he did no sin, there was no sin found in him. But Rome says, no, Mary lived a totally sinless life. When it comes to our salvation, the Bible says that Christ, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God. But Pius XII said, no, Mary offered Christ on Golgotha to the eternal Father. So she is offering her son up, whereas the scripture says that Christ offered himself. Christ today reigns alone in heaven. He is seated in glory, the King of kings and Lord of lords. But the Catholic Catechism tells us that Mary is the Queen of heaven. The Bible tells me that Christ is the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible tells me that if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But the Catholic Catechism says no Mary is a mediatrix and that she is an advocate. So we can immediately see that the Christ, the person of Christ in the scriptures is very different from the person of the Christ in Roman Catholicism. Now when we come to the work of Christ, we find that the Bible teaches that the work of Christ was all sufficient. It says by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Is that what the Roman Catholic Church teaches? Paragraph 1473 of the Catholic Catechism says, The forgiveness of sin and the restoration of communion with God entail the remission of the eternal punishment of sin, but temporal punishment of sin remains. In other words, Rome is saying that the sacrifice of Christ has dealt with the problem of eternal punishment, but God still imposes a temporal punishment which the cross of Christ does not satisfy. And so you as an individual Catholic, you have to discharge that temporal punishment, either in this life through the trials and sorrows and miseries, or you suffer after death in a place called purgatory. So the Christ of Calvary, his work, according to the scriptures, is totally sufficient to take people to heaven. He has once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. But Rome says, no, he has only partially suffered, and you have to include your sufferings and all the rest to get yourself to heaven. So they have a wrong view of the person and the work of Christ. So in other words, they have a wrong view of salvation. The Bible says that Christ saves to the uttermost all those who come unto God by him. But Rome says, no, Christ has done his bit, you have to do your bit. So without doubt, 
the Roman Catholic religion is the largest religious cult in the world. When one is considering Roman Catholicism, one of the things that you find is that the authority under which the Roman Catholic must live is not restricted to the scriptures alone. He is also bound by what is known as sacred tradition. And then hovering above both the Bible and sacred tradition, you have the magisterium. The magisterium will tell you what the scriptures supposedly mean. They will all you tell you, also tell you what constitutes tradition. So the Bible and tradition are both under the authority of the magisterium. Now, is that what we find in the scripture? I think it's good to look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he was contending with the, the devil uh, in the desert, being tempted, he constantly referred to the written word of God. It is written. And then when he was debating with the Pharisees, he said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures. He referred again to the scriptures. Then after his resurrection, he met the, the two downcast disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they could relate to him all the events that had happened, but they didn't understand the significance of them. So the Lord Jesus Christ opened up the scriptures, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He referred again to the written word of God. And he also said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not make you, uh, shall not pass away. The scriptures are able to make a person wise unto salvation. They are also able to sanctify the believer. Uh, I, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. There's no reference here to sacred tradition. There's no reference here to the teachings of man. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ condemned tradition. He said to the Pharisees that through your tradition you've made the word of God of none effect. And what were Peter's instructions when he was responding to the high priest? He said, we ought to obey God rather than man. The only authority that the Christian bows to is the inscripturated word of God, which the Lord Jesus Christ said is truth. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, if a tradition, if a church has a particular tradition, a particular way of doing something, as long as it doesn't violate the word of God, then I don't have a problem with it. But the problem is that when somebody comes up with a tradition which clearly contradicts the Word of God, then who do you believe? Well, you go with the Word of God, not the tradition. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church claims to have the power to create saints. Uh, there is a process. Uh, first of all, the dead person is beatified. They are beatified on the basis that they have lived a holy life, that they are now considered to be in heaven, and that they may now be venerated. And then, a little further down the line, they may be canonized, and this takes place at St. Peter's Basilica. And this is when the person actually becomes a saint. For that to happen, they have to be credited with answering prayers which lead to two miracles. And instead of being now, it's optional that you venerate them, they must be venerated. Now, does any human agency have the power to create saints? The answer is no. Because the reality is that all true believers are saints. It means to be sanctified, to be set apart unto God. And that happens when a true believer is born again of the Spirit of God. The scriptures talk regularly of the saints. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. I was speaking of the Apostle Paul. And Paul himself said, And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, etc. And another verse says, And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwell at Lydda. So all the early New Testament converts were regarded as saints. Rome would say, Yes, that was the early practice, but now the church, it's restricted, and the church has the authority to create saints. In the Pocket Catholic Dictionary, it says, it was early restricted to persons who were eminent in holiness and whom the church honors as saints by a solemn definition called canonization. So they, for whatever reason, have decided that what happened in the scripture is no longer applicable and that they have the power to deem someone to be a saint. All I would say is simply this. If a person is not a saint, that is sanctified, set apart in Christ when they die, they are in hell. 
Uh, there is great pressure from many quarters urging evangelicals and Catholics to get together to proclaim the gospel. And we hear this expression, the gospel, used so many times. Now, personally, I have searched usually in vain for a clear definition in Roman Catholicism as to what is the gospel. In an official pocket Catholic dictionary, it talks of a variety of nuances of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have a book by a Father Henry Newman. It's called Creative Ministry. And he says, the core of the gospel, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. So for Father Newman, the core of the gospel is really a summary of the Ten Commandments. The first four tell you how to love God. The last six tell you how to love your neighbor. That is a false gospel. The gospel is not telling man what he must do. The gospel is telling man what Christ has done. And the good news is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What does it mean he died for our sins according to the Scriptures? Well, as predicted and prophesied in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. In other words, all that was necessary for a believer to have peace with God was laid upon Christ on the cross. Rome denies that. And so they have a false gospel. And so the scriptures teach that True believers are not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And I'm sure people listening will know the rest of that quotation. Evangelical Christians should not unite with Rome because Rome has a false gospel. We hear much talk, particularly at missionary conventions, about the Great Commission. But some people today seem to see the Great Commission in terms of a moral crusade. If you look at the 1994 ECT document, we read in section 4 uh, that the signatories will contend together for a whole shopping list of particular issues, such as that politics, law, and culture must be secured by moral truth, for religious freedom, for the legal protection of the unborn, to resist euthanasia, eugenics, population control, contend together for schools that transmit our cultural heritage, for parental choice in education, and against pornography. This sounds like a political manifesto, a moral crusade. It's interesting to read what Pastor Tom Watson wrote in his book, The Redefining of a Christian, and here I quote, When morality becomes an end in itself, then all who unite toward that end become your brothers. This new morality has not only the potential to unite Catholics and evangelicals, but all religions of the world. This new morality redefines the believer. I think we need to bear in mind a quotation, and I think it comes from Vance Havner. He said, the function of the church is to evangelize the world, not to Christianize it. There are people today trying to impose what they term as Christian values upon unbelievers. That is not the purpose of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is concerned with the sin issue, which is common to all mankind. And we will never deal with these problems which are listed unless we first deal with the root cause, which is the sinful heart of man. And only the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. As many people know, in March 1994, a document called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission for the Third Millennium, uh, was published in America. And we have an expression in Ireland which says that when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. In other words, what happens in America will eventually impact the rest of the world. And sure enough, in uh, 1998, at the end of July, Ireland got its own version of the ECT document. Uh, one of the major signatories to the first document, Dr. J.I. Packer, came to Ireland, and for two days in company of a priest called Father Pat Collins, he promoted this document, ECT Ireland. And uh, personally, it was extremely sad to see the performance of this man who had previously been held in high esteem, trying to justify how 
evangelicalism could somehow be married together with Roman Catholicism. And so yes, the ECT uh, document of 94 has had an impact in Ireland. It has once more fueled the fire of false ecumenism. Uh, it, it tends to die down from time to time, but then perhaps through charismatic experiences, uh, Roman Catholics saying I've had a charismatic experience, liberal Protestants saying the same, therefore we must unite and promote ecumenism and uh, that will maybe stoke the, the fires of ecumenism for a while and then as I say we have this ECT coming along once more to fan the flames. So this has done great damage to the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and has certainly impacted in Ireland.